Well, hey there, uh, Fox Chapel families. Um, I'm hoping you're tuned in and things are working well. Hoping that you're doing well at home and uh, in these strange times. But we're here tonight to talk about financial aid. And um, you are my first uh, group. <clears throat> so I hope things are working well. Um, uh, I've had great support from Tara DeComo, your school counselor, one of your school counselors. And I think you should all know that. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to get on with this presentation. I have about 42 of you, I think, online right now. So that's great. Great, great response. Um, and I want to let you know a couple of things. Um, I am sending to Tara uh, materials. So your son or daughter should be bringing those home to you. And I also want to in introduce myself uh, to you. My name is Marion Hargrave. I work for the Pennsylvania Higher Education Assistance Agency. Um, and I really appreciate your patience right now because um, because I'm just learning this. So, now, if you have questions after tonight's event, you can call me at any point in time. Not satisfied with that. Um, so let me just tell you, my um, email is m h a r g r a v at fia.org and also my home oh, my work number is uh 724-614-3823 you are absolutely welcome to call me at any point in time this is not the slide i wanted to show you but it does have my contact information <clears throat> That is a colleague of mine who is not helping me tonight, um, but at least you have my <clears throat> contact information. And uh, I know Tara could get you in touch with me at any point in time. So let's get this started. If um, we have no glitches, let's just go with Financial Aid 101. So financial aid is in part divided by two things, gift aid, which is based on financial need. And not everyone qualifies for financial need <clears throat> and or there's merit, which is based on your students' achievements, talents, characteristics. Um, and those sources could come from you know, any outside organization. Think about your rotaries, think about your employers, <clears throat> think about, you know, what I'm sure Tara sends to you and the other counselors at Fox Chapel sends to you uh, and sends to your student, whether they bring it home or not, uh, regarding aid. Um, those are all really, really important. And then, <clears throat> then there's self-help aid. And self-help means money that obviously comes from your family. So work study that your student might earn, um, something that your employer as a parent may offer, um, tuition assistance, 
meaning 529s, which we call uh, TAP programs, tuition account programs. They could be in or outside of Pennsylvania. And then, of course, loans. So what we're going to look at is financial aid in five easy steps. As soon as I get there. Uh, bear with me, folks. <clears throat> so a couple of things about financial aid. It's not guaranteed. In terms of need-based aid, the government has a certain formula that they use and that they apply to determine your student's need. And there is no guarantee that your student is going to receive financial aid. So what I encourage families to do is to, to determine like, what is your threshold? And that's the last bullet point on this slide. What is your threshold about what you will spend for your students education. And I know sometimes a lot of families don't like this, but I would kind of chalk it up to what you consider, what would you buy a car for? And when is it, you know, when is it affordable? You know, and are you going to get a return or is your student going to get a return on that investment? And I think that's, I think that's pretty uh, important because you parents are, as parents, buying a product and your student needs to complete that product. <clears throat> and there's a lot that goes into that. So a couple of things to help you is every school has a net price calculator. And you would find that on their websites. They are required to have that. And that net price calculator helps you to determine your student's final average cost. Now, some net price calculators are better than others. Um, the federal government does put out one, but some schools put out other better ones, so it's up to the school. But the bottom line is, it's gonna tell you, what is, what's my final total cost for my kiddo to attend a certain school? You should look at those. Uh, they're, certainly, they're certainly important, and they're mandated by the federal government. So if we were to look at, like I said, the five financial aid uh, steps, the first one, <laughs> because it's really, really important, you don't want to give up on free money, is to look for free money first. <clears throat> and that would be scholarships. And I don't know how many students are out there right now, but parents, if there is anything you can do to implore your student to look for uh, scholarships, it's really, really important. Because again, it is free money. And I know that your high school, Fox Chapel, uh, promotes uh, scholarships, and it may not happen yet. It's a little early, and it's a weird year. So, <clears throat> 
give it a minute, and I think also schools, post-secondary schools, will allow you a little uh, leeway. Um, but you really need to know about scholarships, that students don't have to be the first in their class. But that free money is extremely important. There are some websites that I wouldn't say that we endorse, but that we know are legitimate. <clears throat> and the first one I would say is what you see here on the right. That's fastweb.com. I would encourage your, your student to create an account with FastWeb. And what they plug in is, you know, the criteria about you and them. Um, it could be about your heritage, your religion, your employer. Uh, and then every time that there is a scholarship that pertains to their criteria, <clears throat> they'll get notified about that. And then secondly, regarding five steps to financial aid, know your specific deadlines. <laughs> so for example, I think students are well aware of admission deadlines, but there are also deadlines for their scholarships. And each school, you know, um, has a specific deadline, and the earlier a student responds to those deadlines for scholarships, et cetera, you know, the more interested the school seems to be in your student, and flip side to that, the more interested your student seems to be in that school. And that's pretty important. Now, the free application for federal financial aid, which is known as the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, will only be available to senior students October 1. So if you are out there right now and you have a senior student, um, October 1 is the first time they could go to studentaid.gov, and that's where they're going to see the FAFSA. Now, if you did that tonight and you went to studentaid.gov, you will not see the current FAFSA for a current senior student. That will only be available after October 1. And a common mistake that families make is they go in maybe prior to October 1, and that is not the correct application. So it will only be available to senior students October 1 and beyond. <clears throat> and schools have priority deadlines. So October 1st is the first time your kiddo can um, look into the FAFSA, but their school might have a FAFSA deadline of November, uh, December, and your student should be aware of those deadlines because the sooner they respond to their FAFSA deadlines, the better off your child will be because that's your student's school choices of saying, if you respond to us by this deadline, you know, you're going to get the best aid application. Now, most of them, honestly, are not until December, January, February. But your student, if they've got a particular school choice in mind, they really should look at those deadlines and, and apply, you know, list their school on the FAFSA by that date. <clears throat> Uh, 
Now, for the Pennsylvania State Grant application, our deadlines are a little bit later. Um, May 1 or August 1. And I know a lot of families or students say, well, I'm not going to go to school in Pennsylvania or I don't care about the Pennsylvania State Grant. But I would encourage your student to apply for the Pennsylvania State Grant by May 1, regardless of what their plans are right now. And we're going to talk more about uh, the Pennsylvania State Grant. So at the moment, we're going to talk about the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, because no matter if your student is choosing a private school, uh, public school, in-state, out-of-state, doesn't matter. This is the primary form that students want to complete. And it is available at studentaid.gov. You can also get there now by fafsa.gov, but the federal government is um, trying to uh, generate your information to federalstudentaid.gov. And that gets your student in touch with the most, well, with all primary federal student aid. So Pell Grants, work study, student loan programs, anything that your student's school choice might offer. And then of course, also the Pennsylvania state grant. So if you are listening to me and your student is a senior going into school 2021, the information you will place on their FAFSA is from 2019. And so if we happen to have junior families on board here tonight, they cannot apply using the FAFSA yet, but when they do, it will be for two years prior income information. Trying to make this not more complicated than it should be. So senior families, the FAFSA information you place would be for 2019, two years prior income, information and that would be true of your students so we all know what we made in 2019 right but your asset information will be as of the day you submit the fafsa and we'll talk about the difference between income and assets but there is there is a distinct difference now FAFSA is available at my student aid. There's mobile applications, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so for full disclosure, there you have that information. Um, students like mobile apps, so it's available. So a FAFSA has to be completed every year that your student is seeking financial aid. Uh, the cool thing is, honestly, that after the first time around that you go through it, to renew it is way more simpler. Uh, so there is a little housekeeping that needs to be done the first time around. But honestly, it takes about 40 minutes to complete the FAFSA. There is skip logic. So by that, I mean that some of you families will complete um, several questions, some of you will never see them. And that's the way it's intended to be. I've been in groups of parents. Um, some folks get out of there very simply in a couple of minutes. And some folks are wondering why, I'm, why is it taking me so long? It is totally based on your income and asset information. Uh, but either way, it will bump you through it. What you do need to do, the filing parent 
and the student needs to create a federal student AID account. Um, and that allows you to do a couple of things. First of all, to sign the FAFSA and also to use the IRS data retrieval tool, which we will talk about. Um, but the reason it's here, part of this program, you know, part of this uh, presentation right now is to tell you, you, you can go and do that now if you have a senior student. So the parent that will be filing the FAFSA with the student and the student should create an FSA ID. And that's also available at Federal Student Aid. Now, so far I've been talking about parents are involved in this process, but that has to do with dependent students. So if you're looking at this screen, unless your student is any of these things, they are dependent. And that means the federal government requires that they complete the FAFSA with a filing parent. Sorry, folks. Now, <clears throat> the slide that you're looking at right now. Who reports the, uh, unless your child is independent, which I am guessing that most of your high school senior students are not, if they have parents living together, whether they're married or not, right? <clears throat> or if your student comes from a divorced household, then the parent that the student lived with the most is the custodial parent, and that is the parent that should complete the information on the FAFSA. If your child is living in a household where there are step parents, then yes, the step parent is part of the income information that has to be reported on the FAFSA. And adoptive parents are treated just like biological. So, on the flip side of that, if you see on the right-hand side, foster parents, legal, legal guardians, anyone else that the student might be living with, they do not place their information on the FAFSA. And sometimes kiddos on the right-hand side of that screen, they fall into a little bit of a murky area. It, it, could, be, uh, it could be parents are uh, parents are um, abandon the child. Um, they, they, their whereabouts cannot be found. They could be in uh, incarcerated, whatever that might be. Well, then that child cannot complete parent information. And so the FAFSA does ask questions to help that student um, sort of eke out that situation. And if that's the case, what I would recommend to you, if any of you fall into this category, you really should have your child's post-secondary schools help to address that. That's, that's really where it lies. So, Students can list up to 10 schools that they're thinking about on the FAFSA. And if those 10 schools change, they can remove or add or, re, you know, remove schools at any point in time. But the max that they can add is 10 schools. And the whole point of me saying this is that um, 
the whole idea of this is to get your financial aid, well, your financial information into the hands of the schools so that they can begin making decisions about your school, your students' uh, aid information. But at any point in time, when your student does change their school, every time they make that update, the schools are aware of that. Now, a component in the FAFSA that you'll come across, and this is why <clears throat> it's helpful to complete your FSA ID ahead of time so that when you are within the FAFSA, you can use the IRS data retrieval tool. And what that is, the IRS DRT will parents and students, but usually parents, because students don't usually have an income to report, but mostly parents, <clears throat> this will automatically import your tax information from, if you're a senior family, 2019. And it brings it right into the FAFSA. So you don't have to manually um, input your tax information. Now, a couple of things. First of all, that's really easy. And second of all, that ensures that schools don't have to verify your tax information because it comes to them right from the IRS. So everybody loves that. So it saves the potential school choices, it saves you. So if you can use the data retrieval tool, that's great. Um, couple of things about the data retrieval tool. If your uh, if your status as far as married or unmarried changed parents between 2019 and now. Well, that probably changed your filing status. So you might not be able to use the data retrieval tool. Uh, if you had an amended return, you might not be able to use the data retrieval tool. Uh, if you filed outside of um, the US, you might not be able to use the data retrieval tool. So there are some exceptions, but it's not bad. It just tells you you can't use it. And then your student's school choice has to eat that out. And, um, and they do, and they figure that out. So it's not horrible, but if you can use it, it's great. I want to tell you that I do see some questions coming in. And it's really hard to do a presentation and answer these questions. So I'm going to go back and try and respond to these questions after my presentation. But I also want to remind you that any of you at any point in time can give me a call. I'll have my con uh, contact information up again at the, at the close of this presentation. Um, it's all new to all of us. It's a new world. But I just want to make sure you know I'm available to help you. So uh, next slide, signing the FAFSA electronically. That's what you do also with that FSA ID account. And parents, I'm going to tell you, because you're the worst offenders, <laughs> I hope you can see the smile, um, do not have your child complete your FSA ID account for you. Students, complete your own FSA ID. And here's why. It's very intuitive. And, you know, it's like any kind of thing we do online. If somebody else does it for you, it's, it's not like you doing it for you. So I would, if you see on that slide, individually is highlighted. Uh, there's a reason for that because what I have dealt with in years past 
are parents who come in with information. They don't know if it's theirs. They don't know if it's their students. You really want to, you really want to create those IDs and you really want to have it like, this is mine. This is my kids. Uh, Cause it matters. And also it's a pain to try and get it fixed. So make sure you know who's is who. Write it down. This is mine as my parent. This is mine as my student. I know it seems like really imbecile, but it's it's really important because because it's a pain to try and resurrect. So I hope that helped you. <laughs> um, So you need the FSA ID to sign the FAFSA. And also down the road, the other reason that the FSA ID or account they're calling it now is really important is because your kid's going to need that to renew their FAFSA, um, to make any corrections um, to their FAFSA, to check it down the road for their loan information. And again, I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence, but, um, you know, it's, it's something that you need down the road and it's not easy to resurrect. So please take that uh, with caution. All right, so this is what your FAFSA will look like when you sign it, when your student signs it, <clears throat> you see the student signature, the parent signature, and then ultimately you get a confirmation page. And that confirmation page, if you, if you see those arrows, it won't say go here to, to see your Pennsylvania state grant but it will say, go here to see your state grant application. Ideally, we would want you to use that link to get to the Pennsylvania state grant form. Now, if you miss it, you space it off, whatever, that's fine, because there's an alternative. But that would be ideally how we would want you to go to the Pennsylvania State Grant Form. And I would also tell you right now, here we are sitting in September, if your kid says, I'm not going to a school in Pennsylvania, there's a lot of, like, a lot of time between here and there. Complete the state grant form anyway. There is no harm. And it's really... <clears throat> just a few questions that we have to ask on the state grant form that we don't get from the FAFSA. And that would be like whether your kid's gonna be full or part-time, whether you have a Pennsylvania tuition account program, savings account, um, the program of study for your kiddo, and your employment status, because we don't get that from the FAFSA. Even though when you complete, parents, when you complete the FAFSA, we get everything but those things. So in order to evaluate your child for a Pennsylvania state grant, we need that other information. And that's the sole purpose of the Pennsylvania state grant form. So I just wanna go back and say, the rest of that, I think, is kind of easily understood. But if you have a Pennsylvania uh, tuition account program, a 529 from Pennsylvania, we exclude that from your assets. That's a good thing. But you... You could have lived in Ohio 20 years ago or whatever other state. We still use that as an asset if it's not from Pennsylvania. 
So that is the point of asking that on the Pennsylvania State Grant Form. And I just want to go back and say I am going to cover income and assets, but where you place 529 information and any other kind of assets that are not qualified, and again, I'm going to cover those, that's under investments on the FAFSA. So I think, I think it'll become clear. So um, so sorry. Uh, if you're still hanging out there with me, appreciate it. So now we're going to get to the fun stuff, right? Um, wish I could see what you're seeing because I don't. Oh, bear with me. So, if you would happen to miss the link to the state grant application, first of all, we're relentless in making sure <clears throat> that your student has every opportunity to complete it. So, what will happen is, if your child completes a FAFSA and they're a Pennsylvania resident, Within a number of days, as soon as we realize that a FAFSA has been completed for them, we will send them a message and say, you're a Pennsylvania resident. Did you mean to miss the state grant form? So be aware of that. Or if your student completely closes out of the FAFSA, and they forgot to go on to the state grant link, within three to five days, as this screen shows, they can go to FIA.org and complete it there. But I guess I wanna say we do everything we can to make sure a student doesn't miss it. <clears throat> if they, if they do it off the FAFSA link, they just simply click what this slide shows you and say, yeah, <laughs> I, I agree, and then they're done. Now, there is one other form, and this has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with the FAFSA, but it, there is another form called the College Scholarship search uh, CSS profile and there's I think 18 schools in Pennsylvania they tend to be private they tend to be selective they tend to be expensive so if your student might be looking into a CSS profile school that is another application they might need to complete and again, I can't verify that for you, but I'm sure Tara can, the guidance office can. Actually, your students should look at their school and see if it's required. And again, I think there's uh, 17 in Pennsylvania, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe 400 throughout the United States. Um, and those are schools that use a different uh, financial aid formula beyond federal and state aid, and that's because they have endowment money. That's that's why that happens. Um, so a couple of things. This is almost beforehand, so I'm going to skip ahead. So what happens next after you complete the FAFSA? The information is you you authorize that it's shared with FIA and all the college choices at that point in time. And if your student changes their college choices, then it's shared with them at that point in time. 
they get something called a student aid report. That's that second bullet that you see in purple. It's an SAR. <clears throat> and also students should be aware of, they're gonna get materials or information sent to them as a result of completing the information, right? And so that brings us to, you know, and it's very early, <laughs> um, you would not probably start seeing compare schools, financial aid offers carefully until maybe February. Um, you know, once your student has applied to their school, has been accepted, they've listed them on the FAFSA, then they start to see this information. So the problem, not the problem, but the thing to look out for is you need to compare schools financial aid notices carefully because they don't all look uniform. They're not required to. Some schools will package in or make notations of federal loans. Some do not. Um, so it's really important that you look at those carefully and make sure like, well, what else does my kid have to do, um, you know, to be eligible for this aid? And, you know, is this aid available beyond just the first year? Because, and this is where I wanna, my soapbox is a lot of parents Um, think like, yeah, we can get through this the first year, but imagine the first year times four and pray to God your kid gets out in four years. So, um, you know, it's more than just looking beyond that first year. And let's see if I can advance my slides. Can I? I don't know. Give me a minute, folks. Um, wow, why can't I? Oh, there we go. Okay, so compare those, but this is down the road. I mean, the most important thing is, I know what you want me to get onto. <laughs> so this is what schools are gonna use to look at your students' uh, aid. It's their cost of attendance, it's their expected family contribution. And that EFC includes both your student and family contribution. So let's look at those each individually. Cost of attendance are these no brainers. Tuition and fees, room and board, right? If your kid's gonna go to school in um, Florida, it's gonna be more expensive. So, I mean, that's gonna change the cost of attendance. Actually, in reality, if your kid's gonna be a biology major, it's probably gonna be more expensive than they're an English major because biology majors break beakers <laughs> and English majors, um, you know, all we have is the library. And then the second thing is the expected family contribution, and that comes from the information that you put on the FAFSA. And your EFC, your expected family contribution, remains the same no matter what school your student attends. So to be really simple, if your student decides to go to Allegheny County Community College, or Carnegie Mellon. So I think I've hit the highs and lows there as far as cost. Your expected family contribution will be the same no matter. So more than likely, you'll be able to cover the cost at uh, uh, CCAC. <clears throat> So just consider that, that does not change. No matter, like 
Never. And that EFC is driven primarily by income. And if your child is dependent, and I assume they are, the major factors are your parent and student income, your assets as of the day you file the FAFSA, the number of people in the household, and the age of the older parent. So just to focus on one thing, the reason why the age of the older parent is important is because parents, you can all do a silent raw at home. The older you are, the more heavily protected your assets are. Although it's increasingly it's increasingly decreasing, but at the moment, the older you are, the more heavily protected your assets are as of the day you complete the FAFSA. So I hope that's helpful to you. <clears throat> um, there are some other, okay, sorry folks. These are things that are not assets. The value of your home, your personal property, your IRAs, your 401ks, your 403bs, the value of your life insurance, they're all excluded from assets. You are not asked about those on the FAFSA. What you would be asked of is your savings as of the date you complete the FAFSA. Um, if you have other investments, if you just have other investments that they're not qualified retirement funds. Um, Roth IRAs are held excludable unless you took a distribution from those. And that's kind of a good way to go. If you have a kiddo, put their money in a Roth IRA, but <clears throat> or life insurance, because it's not asked about. So what happens is, and this is why I said there's a protection allowance for parents. <clears throat> parents get pretty nicely treated in terms of assets. Just 6% of any asset that you would have outside of all those things you say or that you see are not assets. Right? So if you had the ability to have other investments, just 6% of that maximum and based on your age would be a part of your expected family contribution, right? Children do not get treated as nicely if they have any income um, or no, I should say assets it's 20%. So by that, I mean, if you've got a trust fund for your kiddo or they've got a whopping savings account, they have to report those and they don't get treated very nicely <clears throat> in this um, formula. So you might want to think about what I said is income is as of 2019, if your child is a senior, but assets are reported as of the day you submit the FAFSA. So I hope that helps you out. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything. Now, so for some families, <clears throat> if you have a lower income, there are no assets counted. Basically, I'm just gonna shoot to the last bullet. If you're student and parent income is less than $49,000 and you didn't file a schedule one on the 1040, right? There's no assets counted. And for students whose family income is less than $27,000 and all of the rest of that uh, counts, just automatically the FAFSA and that, and that is sometimes why um, 
some families have to answer more questions than others because they're if you have that income situation it just doesn't matter and then ultimately right you've completed all that financial aid information you sent it to the schools and now they will send your student we have stopped referring to it as an award because it's really not. It's an aid notification and the schools will tell your student what their aid package looks like. And again, that's way down the road. And I have loved and hated this slide because the last step is be sure you have the money, be sure you have the money you need. Well, nobody ever has the money they need. Like, I know that, you know that. Um, but that's again where, you know, sometimes students have to make a second choice. Maybe it's not affordable for them to go to a certain school. Maybe there is more they can do at that school, you know, as far as scholarships. And that's when you have to start like, um, shimmying the the tree and ask that school is there anything else and and think about uh your costs after the first year because it, it's again it's like buying a product <clears throat> and to be honest i think anybody who's gone to school will tell you it really wasn't about the school is what i did at that school Make sure you understand the conditions uh, of the award package because sometimes there are. Let's say your kiddo gets a band scholarship, <laughs> um, but they don't want to play in the band. I mean, that's that's like some something you need to know. Okay, so a couple of things. So you're answering the FAFSA based on 2019. Things could have changed especially now, uh, between now and then. I've talked to numerous parents who've lost job based on uh, the pandemic, et cetera, whatever it might be. You have to answer the FAFSA the way it asks you, but the only thing you can do if things change is to contact your student's school choice. And that might not be now because your student might not have made their school choice, but you really, that's your only recourse. You have to answer the FAFSA as it pertained in terms of income as far as 2019. Assets, different thing. That's of the day you, you submit it, right? Um, so just be aware of that. Now, here's the, the point at which you all, and I can see that there are about 60 of you out there. <laughs> now you hate me and I'm sorry, because this is the federal aid money that's out there. The Pell Grant, which maxes out at about 6,300 bucks. If you have an expected family contribution of more than $5,711, your student is not going to receive that. There's something called the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. That's up to $4,000. Most students on average see about $1,500. And then there's federal work study. There's also state work study. But, and I don't say this to be glib, um, that's not a lot of money when your kids are looking at $30,000 a year in tuition. I get that. And so what I also get is a lot of families who say, well, how are we gonna make that up? <laughs> And unless you have the coffers, you're going to make it up in loans. Now, as far as the Pennsylvania State Grant, 
That is based on, if you see this slide, that is based on the amount of your student's school. And we are lucky this year to offer a maximum of $4,525. That is in part through the CARES Act, but that is the highest cost tier I am guessing most of your kids are going to go to schools that cost more than twenty-nine to thirty-two thousand dollars. I don't know why, because I think there are a lot of other options. But regardless, um, that's the max, and that's in-state uh, for a maximum qualified student. Now, there's other state programs, and I can't remember if I said it at the beginning of this presentation, but I am sending materials to the high school, Fox Chapel, and to Tara, and I know she's diligent in getting them out there. Um, but these are all detailed in what we call the student aid guide. It's really a comprehensive guide. <clears throat> but they have very specific, uh, bear with me. They have very specific requirements. Uh, uh, these special programs have very specific requirements. So you would want to look into them and maybe your kiddo um, would be eligible for them. Give me a second and I appreciate your patience. Okay, so. So then we look at loans. Because parents say, like, well, how are we supposed to fill in that gap? My kids go into a school that costs thirty-five thousand dollars a year. First of all, did your child seek out any scholarships to mitigate that? That'd be my first thought. And then, secondly, the first thing that we recommend is that your child looks at federal student loans. And here's why: I'm not. Um, I'm not selling federal student loans by any means, but federal loans offer a lot of benefits. First of all, your child has no um, credit history. They have, there's no reason that anybody would give them a loan except for the federal government. But if you look at this screen, the federal government will say, yeah, we'll give them a loan. But there are, there's a max each year. And that year is not based on, you know, you could be a senior for five years or a freshman. I, I, that's the way I should have said it, for five years. That is based on the number of credits they've completed. So the government is saying, yeah, we'll let them borrow, but we're only gonna let them borrow so much. But the, um, the benefit is they have great, re payment plans, they can be um, um, dismissed if your child is permanently disabled. And I know that's an awful thing to say, but consider that your child might be 30 and gets cancer. I hate to say it, but their federal loans can be dismissed if that's the case. You know what I mean? So federal loans are a good thing to exhaust at first, but if you look at these limits, your child might need more. And that's just based on the school that they go to. So then there is a parent loan alternative, and that's called a parent loan for undergraduate students. Parents, virtually none of you ever get denied for a plus loan, and you know what? I gotta be honest, I'm looking at this slide. That interest rate is down to 
Um, so note to self, <clears throat> when the economy's in the tank, federal loans go, <laughs> they go well. Uh, so that 7.8 that you see, that's, that's down to five point something. And if you go to uh, studentaid.com or .org, I'm sorry, that'll give you the most, and I'll update that after tonight. I, my apologies. But so for, there's the federal student loan, there's the parent loan, but what you all have parents, I'm on this slide, what you have to decide is whether or not you can do better than this federal loan. Because for students, that's a really good deal. For parents, you need to think about that. Uh, and if you do, if you do think about it, there are private loans. And private loans are from lenders. Uh, Sally May, PNC. Wells Fargo. And also FIA is affiliated with one called PA Forward. And that is available to Pennsylvania students, whether they go in state or out of state. And all I would do is direct you to FIA.org to look into that because I'm also, you know, as I said earlier, I'm not in the business of selling loans. But I will tell you that it's a very friendly loan to Pennsylvania residents. Um, the interest rates are low. The terms are decent. So you should look at that. And that's at FIA.org. Um, and we offer that to undergrads, grads, parents, pretty lenient on who can borrow on behalf of the student etc. But the reason that comes at this point in my presentation is if you're looking at the cost of education and you're like, did you see my one or two slides about financial aid? Not a lot. So unless you have your own personal means, you're probably going to borrow and then you have to consider how to borrow the best way. Um, but I also want to remind, if your student has not looked at um, scholarships, that's how you fill that gap. So I just want to say in closing, we have also a website called My Smart Borrowing. So your kiddo or you could tinker around with this, put in, uh, oh, we're thinking about Carnegie Mellon. Uh, this is what we have saved to contribute. This is what we think she's going to get. And what's the bottom line? And it will show you what your child will be on the hook for, <clears throat> for borrowing. And I've used this tool in the classroom, and it's an eye-opener. And it's not to be discouraging, so please don't... Um, misunderstand me, but it's a reality check because, um, you know, sometimes there's, I always tell kiddos, there's other ways to skin a cat, right? Um, so maybe that school you love, you love, but it's not the be all and end all. So it's a, it's a really nice tool to look at. Um, so I want to make sure this is my contact information. And I know Tara, any of the counselors at Fox Chapel could help you get in touch with me. Um, it's seven o'clock. I'll be around if you want to call me tonight. I see some chat. I'm going to do my best. To answer that. But if you want to give me a call tonight, I'll be around till nine. I'm happy to help you and I will be happy to help you anytime. Um, 
So let me know if there's anything I can do for you. I want to point out that my last name does have an E on the end of it because I work for the state. Uh, my email does not, just to make things fun, right, and confusing. So that is not a typo. It's M-H-A-R-G-R-A-V at FIA.org. And I'm here for you. I wish you all the best. I thank you for tuning in. Looks like we had a good group tonight. That's all I can really see. So um, thank you, and I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, hey, Tara, wait, I'm going to unmute you. Hi. Did I unmute you? All right. Can now can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining oh. us. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to answer salutation. Yeah, I was trying to answer some of the questions on the side. Oh, thank, thank you. you for presenting. And I will send up the presentation next week when I receive it and feel free to ask any questions you may need by email. Marion's great and she'll help you along this way. Thanks, Tara. Have a good night. Yeah. yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you, everybody. All right. Good night. Good night. Hello? How'd it go? What do you think? No. I know. I know. I have this stupid thing I couldn't make them advance. Ugh. Was it bad? Yeah. I know. Well, well, so I do have a colleague that's able to help me. I'm going to admit this to you. I was like, I don't want your help on my first night. <laughs> you know, so I don't see
All right, thanks, Karen. Yep, thank you. All right, bye. What? Oh, no, I left the meeting. <laughs>